This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Invisible Hate. I'm Asa the Butt. And I'm Sadia Khan. Sadia. Welcome back. How was your week? Anything exciting? Yeah, Sid. I am going on regular hikes because where I live, there are really nice hike trails. And every Sunday, I go on a hike with my husband, which is always fun because we get to talk about a lot of things, right? Which we are unable to talk about at home. And it's spring, so I thought, you know, I should set some fitness goals for myself, health and fitness goals. And I also decided to get this fitness app on my phone and set a target of 10,000 steps every day. Nice. And I kid you not, Asit, it is so fucking hard <laughs> to get to 10,000 steps. Sadia, you got to get out of the house. Go for Go for a daily walk. I'm telling you, only on the days when I'm hiking, I'm able to meet that goal. And then this app chastises me and scolds me for not closing the fucking ring. Oh, it's Apple, Apple Health or something? Yeah, totally. I get it. Yeah, so that's what's been happening with me. But I'm determined, Asad. I will do it. I will that's meet great. that goal. Good for your marriage. Good for your health. It's Yeah, I think this is all good stuff. You know, but I have a question for you, Asad. Yeah. Why do you think we set these arbitrary goals for ourselves and measure our self-worth through them? Yeah, you know, I, that 10,000 steps, they recently announced that it's like such a myth that you don't necessarily need to get that. It could be 5,000 or it could be 15,000, depending on your, your health and, and all that kind of stuff. I've actually, I've been tracking my steps for whew, maybe like 15 or 20 years, Sadia, like a really long time. Oh, and no. I started with a pedometer <laughs> that I would clip to my belt, <laughs> you know, next to my uh, cell phone flip phone, you know, on my belt. And then, you know, gradually uh, now I have, you know, whatever Fitbit that I've been using for forever. But I have recently moved from uh, measuring steps to measuring active minutes. So that's when your heart rate is in a certain zone. And so that's kind of the stuff hmm. that I measure. And I, you know, the goal is to get to a couple hundred, you know, active minutes a week. And so, you know, there are some days where I'm at 10 and there are other days when I, you know, go for a run or whatever that I'm at like 150. But that that's kind of more where I'm at right now with in terms of me measuring fitness. But also, yeah, why do I do this? <laughs> Who am I competing against? But I said, is it more doable compared to steps? <laughs> I mean, it depends, Sadia, like, is, uh, are you OK with? getting your sweat on. So, you know, like huh. active minutes means that your your heart rate is getting up. And so, I mean, I think in terms of fitness, in terms of like why you're doing what you're doing, you want to be in those zones because that's better for your heart. It's better for burning calories. It's better for, you know, all those things. I would imagine that, you know, on your hikes that you are in those zones because you're, you know, you're, you know, you're hiking. I said there's something else that I'm also doing, which I want to share with our listeners, and it may sound really crazy, but I read somewhere and I do read a lot of stupid stuff. So just bear with me that if you drink vinegar water before oh. every meal, your sugar level doesn't spike. So I've started doing that and I'm drinking vinegar water three to four times a day. Oh, my goodness, Sadia. Which is crazy. I, I feel like you'll be storming um, the Capitol sometime, you know, soon with all these little these little things. I know. I know. This is crazy. I, I think I'm all for people trying to figure out what works for them when it comes to maintaining fitness or losing weight or whatever. And if this works for you, you know, I think then that's great. And as long as it's not really, you know, super harmful to your body or to your mental health, then then I'm all for it. So, you know, I've I've experimented with all sorts of diets over the years. And, you know, you got to keep on experimenting to find what works for you. 
Right now, I'm in the eat as much sugar as possible diet. And, and oh, you so, are? <laughs> because oh. I'm so tired from keeping this baby al- alive. <laughs> I'm sure, Asit. I'm sure it's not easy. I, I've been there. It's so tough. And I'm sure you're doing an amazing, amazing job as a dad. Well, thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you saying that. So, Sadia, should we get to today's story? Yeah, Absolutely. Today, we're actually going to talk about a different kind of case, an unusual one without a specific victim per se, and one that enters kind of the realm of cyber crimes, and one that relates in a lot of ways to the crimes that we talk about here on Invisible Hate. And so, you know, most of you are familiar with the company called Merriam-Webster, you know, the dictionary company. Merriam-Webster is considered the kind of foremost publisher of language-related reference works and is kind of the gold standard for dictionaries in offices and households and schools around the U.S., basically since the early 1800s. And, you know, some of you may know that, like, new words come up all the time, and sometimes, you know, they're invented and sometimes they're based on changing cultural trends. And so the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online gets updated pretty frequently. Peter Sokolowski is the editor-at-large at at Merriam-Webster, and he tells Western Mass News adding words to the dictionary is a give-and-take relationship. We find the words used in print, often online, often in magazines or books, or even menus or soup can labels. Um, If we see a word that's used frequently in those locations where a lot of people are likely to see it, then it goes into the dictionary. And you should know that the website is actually interactive, so like people can post comments and things on there, you know, uh, based on the changes that are happening. And so, you know, in 2021, during the week of October 2nd, a person named Jeremy David Hansen, a 34-year-old white man living in Orange County, discovers certain updates to which he takes really great offense. And in particular, as you can imagine, Sadia, he's taking offense to the updated definitions of the words girl, boy, female, and trans woman. Hmm. And so, you know, Hansen, through the site's Contact Us page and in the comment section, starts making online threats to the company. He alleges that the recently revised and more inclusive entries accounting for gender identity rather than gender assigned at birth are, quote, fake definitions and anti-science propaganda. And so over the course of six days, he leaves various violent remarks, including, quote, the imbecile who wrote this entry should be hunted down and shot. Another thing that he wrote, I'm going to shoot up and bomb your offices for lying and creating fake definitions in order to pander to the training mafia. And another, he said, I will assassinate your top editor. And then one final example, he said, it would be poetic justice to have someone storm your offices and shoot up the place, leaving none of you commies alive. And so, Sadia, as you can imagine, executive management of the company becomes aware of the threats that Hansen has posted. And that happened on the fifth day of the virtual rampage. And so on the next day, they contact the FBI after they found out that he keeps on doing this. And, you know, as a result, Merriam-Webster, who has their headquarters in Springfield, Massachusetts, and offices in New York City, they actually shut down for five days because of the threats. Merriam-Webster begins an investigation, but the senior web operations engineer involved can't identify the IP address, you know, the internet address for Hansen's initial remarks. You know, and this is one of those sites that you can post on without registering, you know, who you are first or your email first. But eventually, with access to third-party sites, the FBI is able to trace the IP address back to Lauren Zack, who is Hansen's mother, whom he lives with. And Hansen himself is eventually tracked down and arrested six months later. Yeah, I said my first question would be, who hurt this person? Like, this person is sad and angry and he has the time to go on this website and then just hate crime folks. Like, 
verbally. It's just bizarre to me. I'm sure he's hurt us. That's the only thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, I don't disagree with that assessment at first, for sure. And you're also right. This is definitely a different kind of case. Legally, I'm not even sure what crime he's committed, though, Asad. Yeah, at first it does seem ridiculous, right? Like maybe even a waste of federal resources. But wait till you hear a little bit more about Hansen, and then I think you'll understand why we chose to talk about this case. Let me guess. Is he a white supremacist? (laughs) Great guess. Before he is charged, FBI Special Agent Casey Anderson, who handles investigations that violate federal law, such as hate crimes and cross-state threats, looks into Hansen and conducts a series of interviews. Anderson asserts that Hansen's activities were fueled by anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ plus bias. Furthermore, because he was sending messages from California, Hansen is alleged to have violated Title 18, which basically, you know, prevents you from, like, posing a threat, you know, across state lines. Anderson shows there is probable cause for a criminal complaint, and Hansen is then arrested and charged on April 20th, 2022. He is placed under house arrest at his mother's uh, house until the trial, with the condition that his access to the internet be heavily restricted. It seems pretty straightforward, right? But it turns out that Hansen has a history of making violent threats. And Sadia, take a guess at how long he'd been engaging in this kind of online behavior. Uh, forever? (laughs) Eight years. Oh, wow. Hansen has been making similar online threats with the repeated involvement of law enforcement for eight years. I said I want to stop you here. And I just want to ask you this question, and I hope if our listeners can answer this. Hating somebody or something requires a lot of energy, effort, mental exertion. Who the fuck has that kind of time and energy to direct at something so disruptive and so unproductive? Why can't people just recalibrate their energy to something better in their lives. You know, social media and everything that we've noticed online with the trends the last decade or so, it makes it so easy to hate and to hate on people and to get riled up, right, and and to create mm. these divisions. And so it does take up a lot of energy, but it's also like team warfare, right? Like it's us versus them and like yeah. – it's sad, but, you know, I recognize how someone can get so riled up because it's happened to me before. I've never posted, though, you know, I don't think, <laughs> you know, anything racist or vitriolic or, or whatever. But I can understand, you know, when you read or see something, you know, sadly, I'm sure, you know, in recent months or recent years with stuff that's been people have been saying about abortion or, you know, gun control that you get riled up and, you know, I, you can see when a person's emotions could boil over to the point where they would post or say something that they might not otherwise, you know, say in real life, they would do that online. You're right. People could have those emotions, but then all of us, I hope most of us have the ability to regulate them, right? Yeah, for sure. I think mostly that comes from drinking vinegar water a couple times a day. (laughs) Three times, that's the three Three times. Okay, fair enough. So going back to the story, you know, the FBI had interviewed Hansen and his mother at least three times already, each time with Hansen seeming remorseful and agreeing to stop. And in a 2015 interview, actually, he admitted to using sites that can anonymize your IP address. And yet sometimes he would issue threats using his real email address, which contains his name, or even sign his name. And other times he would use a handle such as this thing called at anonymous which is a character from a dark fantasy series or variations of the phrase kill all marxist teachers and so you know basically he was he was showing remorse and then continuing with the same activities and you know sadly apparently when agents came to arrest him he actually threatened to bomb the fbi itself wow i said so this seems like indiscriminate discrimination he's ready to kill everyone or anyone for that matter right Like he has a problem with anyone he considers leftist. But FBI is not really leftist, is it, Asif? (laughs) Depends on who you're talking to, yeah. (laughs) 
Anyways, tell me a little more about who Hansen really is. He is definitely a complicated person. He clearly had a history of making violent threats, but actually doesn't have a history of acting on any. He was reclusive, um, an avid Donald Trump supporter, and had recently become fixated on transgender people, according to his mom. Despite being in his 30s, his mother cared for him and said he had an emotional maturity of like a 13 to 16 year old. She said he had developmental delays and had been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, depression, anxiety, and OCD, and took multiple medications for these. Hansen himself did not think he had mental health issues, only problems with impulse control. His mother described him as prone to, quote, verbal hyperbole. And for those that don't know what hyperbole is, I went to Merriam-Webster for the definition, and it says, extravagant exaggeration used to emphasize a point. Evidently, he had his meds changed shortly before the Merriam-Webster incident and was also upset about COVID restrictions. I said I hear what you're saying and it makes me pause and think, but at the same time, that wouldn't really account for the eight years of threats, right? Yeah. And also, people with autism or mental health issues usually are not violent and we've said this again and again, right? So I am a bit conflicted here. I do see where his mother is coming from and he may have certain mental health issues which he probably doesn't even recognize. But at the same time, all these threats could be part of who he is and not related to his mental health. I don't know. I'm confused. I I don't disagree. His mother actually told the FBI that he was unable to gauge the consequences of his actions. Yet he told agents that he understood the difference between expressing a dislike for something and making a threat and conveyed regret in his interviews with them. One has to wonder, you know, was he actually earnest about that? A psychology resident, by the way, evaluated him and said he was mentally fit for the latest FBI interview. And evidently, Hansen usually vented his rage to his mother, but once she'd go to sleep and he was unsupervised, he resorted to posting online instead. She made a point of saying he did not have access to weapons and that his only digital device recently was his PlayStation. I said, this is so interesting because it seems like he is contradicting his mother, right? So his mother is saying, oh, he has mental health issues, but then he's like, no, I don't. And then a psychology resident says he doesn't have mental health issues. He's mentally fit. I see this as a compulsive behavior and more something that a lot of people who are in a way addicted to social media would do. And again, I'm no expert on mental health or or in psychology, but that's how I see this. And at the very least, he definitely has anger management and maybe cognitive problems. But as said, how did the trial play out? Yeah, so Hansen was facing a maximum of five years in prison, three years of supervised release, and $250,000 in fines. His lawyer claimed he had significant mental health issues. And while under house arrest until the trial, the judge actually ordered his mom to monitor all his virtual conversations, like with his lawyers and doctors. And this is despite the objection of his defense team claiming he needed privacy for telehealth visits and for attorney client privilege. Each side argued the feasibility of buying him a flip phone without access to the internet. And then what ended up happening actually was that in September 2022, He ended up taking a plea deal in federal court in Springfield, Massachusetts. While he was initially arrested for the threats to Merriam-Webster, he conceded guilt to two federal counts of threats of violence over interstate communications for sending what he did to Merriam-Webster and also some other stuff that he'd done on the internet in the past. And I don't know why they singled those two particular instances out, but I assume it was because they were the most extensive and violent threats or because the victims pressed charges. That said, while these were the only two charges, part of the plea deal was him admitting to sending threats to a host of other corporations, educators, and politicians, and often choosing victims based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. Between the hearing and sentencing, Hansen was again released to his mother's house with strict supervision by probation officers. That is until he began threatening them, messing with his tracking devices, 
and turning on his therapist, he also intended to send the local newspaper an angry letter about a juvenile mental health program that he believed would make kids weak, which his mother talked him out of with a bribe of a jack-in-the-box Happy Meal, again calling into question his cognitive abilities. The probation officer stated that they were no longer willing to monitor him and asked that he be jailed until sentencing, which the judge granted. And then to the judge's credit, she asked his probation officers and lawyers to look into treatment programs within the judicial system that would be more qualified to handle Hansen. And then this past April in 2023, Hansen was sentenced to a year and a day in prison plus three years of supervised release. His attorney anticipated four months in prison after time already served and other credits and said she felt the penalty was fair and would grant him the resources needed to prevent conduct like this in the future. And then U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins said, quote, I hope today's sentence will demonstrate to members of the LGBTQ plus community that this office will hold those who engage in threatening, hateful acts accountable. Mr. Hansen made numerous anonymous hate-fueled threats of violence to intimidate and instill fear, hateful and bigoted acts, even if only spoken like those committed by Mr. Hansen, terrorize communities and are destructive to society. So, Savia, what do you think about this? What is your reaction? I said I see it as incitement of violence, so I don't consider it as a free speech but at the same time, the more information I have, the more uncertain I am about whether or not Hansen really suffered from mental health, right? Because there is this tendency to be compulsive in nature, and I don't know if that's connected to his mental health issues. So I am a bit conflicted. I do recognize the harm that it could cause individuals and communities and how fearful communities, especially LGBTQ plus community would be. But at the same time, I'm not sure if sending him to prison would serve the intended purpose. Mm. Yeah, I definitely uh, can see that as well. I mean, I think, you know, this is an interesting case. Can cyber crimes be considered hate crimes, Sadia? How do you feel about that? That's an interesting question. Again, they could be if they are inciting violence against somebody based on their perceived racial, ethnic identity, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, which in this case is true. That's how I see it. But at the same time, I'm not sure if this person was mindful of what he was doing. Yeah. And, you know, I think for me, the reason that, you know, I chose this case is that we want to demonstrate that hate crimes can be in words alone. And, you know, it's not just action sometimes. But moreover, you know, so many times we hear about someone murdering a stranger or yet another mass shooting and it's accompanied by hate speech or demonstrated bias or threats on social media and that people like didn't see the signs. I said I am also interested in seeing if we could have more experts evaluate Hansen's mental health and make a determination of whether or not he has mental health issues. That's something that I am more interested in knowing about. Because as you were reading through all the stuff that he's been doing and how impulsive and compulsive he's been in his behavior, it really does make me think that he may actually have some mental health issues that his mother has been alluding to or talking about. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I, I, I do think that for me, this falls more into mental health as opposed to hate crime right. territory. And we know the state of mental health care in the States. It's really hard for someone to get access to the care that they need. And it takes a long time as well. I, I think, you know, for me, the big question is why was he doing this for eight years and nobody was taking notice? And when they did take notice, why did it take so long for him to get the help that he needed? Like, could a jail sentence have been avoided you know, if he got the treatment that he needed earlier in, in his journey. It's just sat all around, right? I said you're absolutely right. But I also would like to mention here that a lot of people don't have the resources to access medical care in America. And that's something that we always have to keep in mind when we are dealing with cases like this. We don't know what their financial situation is. We don't know what their job situation is. So a lot of questions to think through and process. 
and you know it could be any one of those reasons why his mother was unable to get him the help that he really needed yeah i agree so what's the latest asad yeah so hansen is presumably in prison and hopefully getting the treatment that he needs now having been just recently sentenced um and then in august of last year 2022 u.s attorney rollins rolled out a new end hate crime hotline in massachusetts for reporting hate-based and potentially criminal activities anonymously um, or otherwise and she said quote hateful and bigoted acts even if only spoken like those committed by Mr. Hansen, terrorize communities and are destructive to our society. Hate-motivated acts of any kind will never be tolerated in our commonwealth and perpetrators, including those who think that they can hide behind a keyboard, need to know that we will find you and we will prosecute you. There's also a national hotline for victims of or witnesses of uh, hate crimes at 1-800-CALL-FBI or you can submit tips online at tips.fbi. Dot gov, um, and you can remain anonymous for both. So, Sadi, any final thoughts or takeaways? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind is why is he in prison and why is he not getting the treatment outside the prison? And I've said this before as well. I don't think prison is a good place, especially for people who apparently suffer from mental health issues. And in this case, we were unable to make that determination fully so i am a bit concerned there in terms of cyber crimes being hate crimes we've already discussed that any any form of hatred that incites violence that makes people hate somebody else based on their existence based on their identity should be treated as such but at the same time this was a difficult case asad i honestly don't know how i feel about hansen or if I think he should be in prison. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I, I struggle with this. And I was just thinking, Sadia, that advice that we can give to our listeners and, and ourselves is unless you are posting something that's additive to the conversation, like, you know, maybe maybe not post it, right? Like on, online. And certainly if you are angry or um, frustrated with something and are leaning towards something that isn't additive, you know, take a shot of vinegar water, right? And see, uh, see what happens <laughs> afterwards. And it's always good to do constructive criticism, Asad. They can yeah. tweet or they can ma- write posts, but they can do it in a constructive way. And if they don't believe in certain policies, then just vote people out who are implementing those policies, right? You have the right to vote, so you can make a difference through vote and through community building and activism you don't have to go the hate route yeah i agree with that as always thank you so much for tuning in to invisible hate i am so grateful to every single person who's listening to us who writes to us who is giving us reviews send us some more love you can review us on apple podcasts give us a thumbs up on spotify it really makes our heart melt it really makes our hearts melt if you want to learn more about invisible hate and the work we are doing check out links in the show notes about the case also email us your thoughts on this story or any other story that you think we should cover you can reach us at info at invisiblehatepodcast.com you can also tweet us or hit us up on instagram just search for invisible hate podcast By the way, thank you to all who are already following us. I see one or two people following us every day and it makes me so happy. Thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, please share with a friend. Invisible Hate is a joint production of Trifilion Media and Immigrantly. We would like to thank our team, which includes Michaela Strathe, Isabel Havens, Lindsay Gamble and Paroma Chakravarti. Our music was done by Simon Hutchinson. We'll be back next week with another hate crime for us to analyze. Until next time, I am Sadia Khan. And I'm Asad Bhatt. Take care.